This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated online cinema streaming exceptional films from around the globe. Get your first month for free at MUBI.com slash Royal Ocean. To the viewers, both the casual and the dedicated of the Royal Ocean Film Society. You know how you can come across someone's opinion about a subject that you're interested in and immediately disagree with what they're saying? What is this? Unsubscribing. But then find that you suddenly got that horrible pit at the bottom of your stomach, because deep down you know that what the person's saying has within it a kernel of truth. It's something you can choose to ignore, you can resist and rage against it, or you can let it have its day in court. Because the more you try and squash it down, the harder it's going to hit when it's inevitably going to get the best of you. At some point, you're just going to have to sigh, swear, and begrudgingly accept it after all. Okay, you're right. I had an experience like this just recently. Christopher Nolan's increasing trend towards gigantism concerns me. Spectacle is not his forte, to put it mildly. Film critic Mike D'Angelo wrote this about The Dark Knight Rises. You son of a- I didn't have a good response when I first read it. And for a while, I tried to ignore it. I brushed it away, I refused to consider it, the heck does D'Angelo even know? But I ended up realizing what this all meant. And therein lies my confession. I am a Christopher Nolan fanboy. <laughs> Watching The Dark Knight for the first time was an eye-opening experience that made me fall head over heels in love with cinema. I used to get in trouble in high school for watching it on my iPod Nano during study hall. His first movie, Following, is a no-budget milestone. It was the thing that got me off my butt at 17 to go make something of myself. I own this t-shirt and have worn it non-ironically. I've carried around my own personal totem ever since Inception came out, and I've got three of the tattoos from Memento. Okay, those last two aren't real, but you get it. Don't question me on my love for Nolan's films. But none of those things make me a fanboy. If we're going to define it, I think a fanboy is someone who's disconnected from reality. It's not just that they accept any product that has their favorite logo slapped on it without question, it's that they're the kind of person who gets pissed off and screams when someone criticizes their favorite things. Especially when that someone is Martin Scorsese. Now, here's the part that matters. A fanboy refuses to recognize flaws even though deep down they may be and probably are aware that they exist. And for as much as Nolan's films mean to me, I don't want to live that way. And so I had to contend with this idea. I had to listen to it and let it have its day in court. Because deep down, I knew D'Angelo was onto something. Because what he wrote instantly reminded me of another filmmaker. The nominees for Best Achievement in Directing are David Lean, David Lean, David Lean, David Lean. David Lean. This Limey is uh, deeply touched and greatly honored. Thank you. If there's a director Nolan's career has most resembled up to this point, then it's that of Sir David Lean. After his early days as an editor, Lean directed a number of extremely well-written and fairly small character pieces. Characters were well-developed, the craft was impeccable, and the emotional payoffs were earned. But starting with A Bridge in the River Kwai in 1957, his films grew increasingly massive in scope. And for a while, everybody was on board. I don't need to say anything about Lawrence of Arabia, because really, what is there left to say? But with the two films that followed, there began to be a general feeling of unbalance. If every director has a recurring flaw that they slip into, then for late career David Lean, it was prioritizing spectacle over character. Dr. Zhivago is good, but it's kind of like a soap opera. The sheer scope of the film, which is utterly massive, is much more at the forefront than anything else. Something Lean doubled down on with his next film. But we'll come back to that. For as much as I didn't want to accept D'Angelo's diagnosis, the recurring flaw Nolan has been trapped by is the same as it was for David Lean. Since The Dark Knight in 2008, the visual scope and conceptual ambition of his films has progressively ballooned. He literally called The Dark Knight Rises the biggest movie anyone's done since the silent era. And he may have just been right about that. I mean, look at this. It's less a Batman movie and more a gargantuan war film. 
Now, by itself, that's impressive. Massive blockbuster scope like this will always be thrilling, especially in a giant IMAX screen. And the best of his films balance spectacle and character. They marry concept and emotion in an inseparable and rewarding way. But if I'm being honest, I have to admit that I think that that balance has slipped the more he's directed. Dark Knight Rises is not only a film that's stuffed with too many characters and subplots, but is one that operates on awkward plot convenience and poorly thought out ideas. I mean, a lot of the ideas and story elements Nolan has played with throughout his films have bordered on the fantastical. Cloning, dream sharing, people dressing up as superheroes. But more so than ever, they're increasingly slipping into territory that's just plain ridiculous. There's something about a dude dressed up as a bat flying a plane over a city with an atomic bomb strapped beneath it that's just... that's too much. It's just... kinda goofy. Nolan's intent over his last few films, I think, is to try and craft something operatic. But the effect in the long term, at least for me, is merely bombastic. It's loud, it's visually impressive, but it's without the lasting impact of his best films. Interstellar fits that especially. Everything in it feels unnecessarily dialed up to 11. Characters don't talk so much as they make speeches. Too many emotional moments feel manipulative rather than earned. And I've never not cringed at just how corny this scene is. Do you see your children? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't watch you go through this, I'm sorry. I thought I could, but I can't. Don't get me wrong, I liked and still do like a lot of the elements Nolan was working with in these two particular films. Despite my frustrations, there are still scenes in them that I find invigorating and moving. But whereas I'm simultaneously impressed and drawn in when I revisit something like Memento or The Prestige, I find that I'm increasingly just impressed at arm's length with his recent work. And I can't deny that the issues I have have only been amplified upon further viewings. But then there's Dunkirk, which sidesteps the whole issue of spectacle over character in an interesting way. Okay, so this is actually the first time I've watched the movie since seeing it in theaters. And I was nervous beforehand because I wanted it to hold up. And it really does, it really holds up. It's, it's a really extraordinary film, but it's really different than anything else he's ever made. Because it basically just, it sidesteps the whole issue of spectacle over character by just going whole hog for spectacle and not really having any characters at all. I mean, there are characters, but it's nothing like he's done in the past. They're much more like pieces on a chessboard. It's, it's very raw, almost to the point of being a, a minimalist kind of approach. The motivation and the goals for each of the characters are extremely simple. The complexity of the film comes from the structure of the edit rather than the ideas of the script. And the overall emotional effect of the film, I would argue, is much more tied to the overarching historical event rather than any drama between characters. Home. I don't say any of that in a negative way. It works extremely well. It's, it's like an experience. It's almost like more of a roller coaster than anything else. But, and again, I don't mean this in a negative way. I don't necessarily know if I want to see him make another movie like this, or at least for a while. Now, to complete my confession, this doesn't specifically have much to do with Tenet. I'm looking forward to it like everyone else. I hope it's great. I hope it's his best film yet. But in general, I'd be lying if I said I'm not nervous that Nolan's films are getting too big for their own good. Back to David Lean. After Dr. Zhivago, Lean directed the absolutely gargantuan Ryan's Daughter. If you haven't seen it, it's a pretty small story. It's the same kind of love triangle plot he'd previously explored in Brief Encounter and The Passionate Friends. Although like Zhivago and its Russian Revolution setting, it's a small story set against a major historical event, the Irish struggle for independence at the end of the First World War. All of it being played out on an insanely massive 70mm canvas. And it 
was completely savaged by critics of the day. Lean's characters, well-written and well-acted, are finally dwarfed by his excessive scale. The original love story seems too frail and too banal to sustain the crushing weight of 3 hours and 18 minutes of Super Panavision. The emptiness of Ryan's daughter shows in practically every frame, and yet the publicity machine has turned it into an artistic event, and the American public is a sucker for the corrupt tastefulness of well-bred English epics. The art it represents belongs to that school of very classy calendar art, supported by airlines, insurance corporations, and a few enlightened barber shops. How could someone who made Brief Encounter make a piece of bull like Ryan's daughter? Jeez, and I thought YouTube comments were harsh. It, it really quite has an awful effect on me. If you get, as I had, on Zhivago and on Ryan's daughter particularly, the sort of notices that I had, um, you begin to think you, that maybe they're right. And I thought, why on earth am I making films? I don't have to. And um, I didn't for a bit. It uh, shakes one's confidence, you know, terribly. It's, um, I find it very difficult directing movies. Well, and. Um, One's awfully easily shaken, you know? Now, let me be clear. The nastiness with which Lean was attacked was just plain wrong. Because Ryan's Daughter is not at all a bad film, it's one that I kind of like. But I do have to agree that the sheer size is a problem. The story being told is a small, intimate one that clashes with the scope Lean was going for. And I'm worried that something similar is happening with Nolan. Despite the fact that I think Dunkirk was a really good, if not great, film, I agree with Mike D'Angelo that his increasing trend towards gigantism is concerning. As silly and presumptuous as it may sound, there's this thing with directors where you kind of just want them to sometimes go off and make a tiny five or ten million dollar picture to get back to their roots. It's arguably what Peter Jackson did with They Shall Not Grow Old after The Hobbit, what Sam Raimi did with Drag Me to Hell after the Spider-Man movies, what David Lean ended up doing with what wound up being his final film, A Passage to India, and also what Nolan himself did when he made The Prestige, which isn't a small film, but is certainly small in comparison to the two Batman movies it's sandwiched between, and I would happily argue is his best movie to date. And I'd kinda like to see him do something like this again. But I'll end by saying that I hope I'm wrong. I hope this fear of mine doesn't end up becoming reality and that Nolan is able to combine large-scale blockbuster filmmaking with indie-level nuance as he's done before. I hope that's what comes to pass. Until then, we'll just have to wait. Please accept this confession as penance and let it absolve me of the title of fanboy. Thank you guys so much for watching. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated online streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Every day they premiere a new film. Whether it's a timeless classic, a cult favorite you've never seen, or an acclaimed masterpiece, there's always something new to discover. Every film comes lovingly handpicked and curated. And because of that, I found that I end up spending way less time browsing and more time actually watching. It's like your own personal film festival that you can stream anytime, anywhere, on any screen or device. And right now they're offering a great deal. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days by going to mubi.com slash royalocean. 